The Bible is a revelation from God of truths immediately bearing on the recovery by divine grace of individual men. But it is more than that. It is also a revelation of truths bearing on the character and condition of men formed into a society of believers and constituting one collective body holding together the faith of Christ. To individual men, whether in a state of sin or a state of salvation, the Bible is a communication from God telling them of truths and doctrines through the belief and renewing influence of which they may be individually recovered from the spiritual ruin of the fall and made partakers under the divine spirit of complete and everlasting redemption. But to the body of believers, not individually, but collectively, the Bible is also a communication from God telling them of truths and doctrines through the right appreciation of which they may be fashioned into a spiritual society with divinely authorized powers and ordinances and office bearers, an outward and public witness for God on the earth, and an instrument for the edification of the people of Christ. Christianity was designed to be something more than the religion of individuals bound together by no tie and gathered into no outward society. In its primary and most important aspect, indeed, the revelation of God contained in the Bible is a revelation to me individually. Its discoveries of my sin and announcements of judgment, its intimations of grace and its proclamations of a Savior, its offers of an atoning blood to expiate and a regenerating spirit to purge transgression. These are addressed to me individually. And if I deal with them at all, I must deal with them as if there were no other in the world except myself and God. Alone with God, I must realize the Bible as if it were a message from Him to my solitary self singled out and separated from other men and feeling my own individual responsibility in receiving or rejecting it. But the Bible does not stop here. It deals with man not only as a solitary unit in his relation to God, but also as a member of a spiritual society gathered together in the name of Jesus. It is not a mere system of doctrines to be believed and precepts to be observed by each individual Christian independently of others and apart from others. It is a system of doctrines and precepts designed and adapted for a society of Christians. This agreement and cooperation of men holding the same faith and the same Savior is not an accidental or voluntary union which has grown up of itself. It is a union designed beforehand, appointed from the beginning by God, and plainly contemplated and required on every page of the New Testament Scriptures. There are precepts in the Bible addressed not to believers separately, but to believers associated together in a corporate society. There are duties that are enjoined upon the body and not upon the members of which it is composed. There are powers assigned to the community to which the individuals of the community are strangers. There is a government, an order, a code of laws, a system of ordinances and officers described in Scripture which can apply to none other than a collective association of Christians. Without the existence of a church or of a body of believers 
as contradistinguished from believers individually. Very much of what is contained in the Bible would be unintelligible and without practical application. Does anybody know who wrote that? You might guess Charles Spurgeon, or you might guess Jonathan Lehman. It's a Scottish Presbyterian, Professor James Bannerman, out of his massive volume, The Church of Christ, written in 1868. And I think, Jonathan, you'd say amen to every word of that passage. It's gloriously precise. And the passage that we're going to study tonight is one of those passages that would be unintelligible if there were no such thing as a local church and local church membership. So I want you to turn in your Bibles now to the book of Acts again. Alistair took us to Acts chapter 9. I'd like you to, to go a little bit further in. Acts 20. Acts 20, 28. And I'm going to discipline myself to look at just one verse in this glorious passage. This is Paul's final address to the Ephesian elders. He has called them together at Miletus to speak to them. And the whole of the passage is glorious. But it's this 28th verse that I want you to give attention to tonight. And before we read God's word, let's pray and ask for his help and blessing. Heavenly Father, this is your word. We do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You have given your word by inspiration, all of it, for our reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that we may be equipped for every good work. You have taught us in the Word how we are conduct to conduct ourselves in all the churches. So speak, Lord. Your servants listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is the Word of God. Hear it. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves. And to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Amen. And thus ends this reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write its eternal truth upon all our hearts. In this passage, the Apostle Paul gives an exhortation to the Ephesian elders, telling them how to go about shepherding the church in Ephesus. And it's very clear from this passage that the shepherds of the church are given this directive for at least four purposes. This directive helps foster the work of the church. Elsewhere in Ephesians 4, a passage which Danny is going to expound for us, we're told that the elders of the church are there to equip, the pastor teachers of the church are there to equip for the saints for the work of service. And so this exhortation is to foster the work of the church, and it's to foster the growth of the church. We want to see the church growing and multiplying and healthy, and it is to foster the unity of the church and the maturity of the church. All of these purposes are in view in Paul's exhortation. But this passage would not make any sense if there were no flock to shepherd, and if there were no church membership to tend. And so I want us to look at the exhortation to the elders and think about what we learn about church membership from what the elders are told to do. And in fact, you can do this across the pages of the New Testament. When you find an exhortation to pastor 
teacher, shepherd, elders in the New Testament as to what they're to do in the local congregation. One of the things you learn is what God wants church members to do and be because the mission of those shepherds is to shape that kind of discipleship. And so I want us to think about this passage in that kind of reverse way tonight to learn what church membership is for, why it's important, what elders and pastors and teachers are up to in their ministry in the life of the local congregation. So let's focus just on this one single verse, but five particular things that I want you to see here. And the first thing you'll see in the very first words, be on guard for yourselves. The Apostle Paul here says that elders are to be spiritual watchmen over themselves. He calls on the elder shepherds of the Ephesian church to a holy vigilance regarding their own hearts and lives. Notice that the very first charge that is given is not to keep watch over the flock. It is not to keep watch over others, but to keep watch over themselves. And I think he means both individually and collectively. That is, the pastor-teacher elders are not only to keep watch on their own souls but on one another's souls. They're to keep watch over themselves. It's not merely a call to be an example to others, but to have a serious concern for their own salvation, for their own spiritual growth, for their own godliness, for their own obedience, for their own general Christian walk. A man who has no concern for his own spiritual condition is in no spiritual condition to care about the spiritual condition of others. And so Paul gives this exhortation, keep watch over yourselves. And you may ask the question, well, what does that entail? And Paul has not left you to guess. To guess, Scripture interprets Scripture, right? Where else does the Apostle Paul urge this very same thing? 1 Timothy chapter 4, turn with me there to verses 6 to 16. 1 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 16. And notice what he says. Be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine. Are you nourishing yourself on the words and the faith, uh, on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine? That's part of what it means to keep watch over yourselves. Verse 7, have nothing to do with worldly fables. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Verse 10, fix your hope on the living God. How often have I met burned out pastors who have lost hope? Fix your hope on the living God because if you fix it anywhere else, you will lose it. Verse 12, in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Live what you preach in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Verse 13, give attention to the public reading of the Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Pastor, teacher, elders need that too, just as much as the people of God. Verse 14, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you. Verse 15, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Verse 16, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So here's Paul's first exhortation to the Ephesian elders, keep watch 
over yourselves. Be on guard for yourselves. And the reason this is important is evident in the very next verse. What does Paul say in Acts 20, verse 29? What is going to happen in Ephesus? After my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you. And then look at verse 30. It's worse than this. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things. You see why it's so urgent that they keep watch, that they keep guard over themselves? Elders must have a prime concern. Pastor, teacher, shepherds must have a prime concern to keep themselves in the fear of the Lord. Here's what Calvin says. A man who neglects his own salvation will never be zealous in concern about the salvation of others. And a man who shows no inclination for godliness will incite others to lead godly lives in vain. A man who forgets about himself will not put out his devotion and effort on the flock, although he himself is part of the flock. Now, what do we learn about church members from that exhortation to the Apostle Paul? We learn that church members are to keep watch over themselves. What does Paul say elsewhere about how you're to come to the Lord's table? You are to do so in self-examination. So do you notice how the exhortation of the pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders actually reflects something that God wants to see in the life of the local body in the church members of the congregation? If the pastor, teacher, shepherd, elder isn't careful for his own soul, the people of God in the congregation who are church members will not be careful for their own souls, and God wants them to be careful for their own souls. Here's the first thing I want you to see in this passage. The second thing is this. Look at the rest of that sentence in Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for all the flock. Here Paul says that elders are to be focused on the task of being concerned for the spiritual needs and welfare of the local body. Paul is calling these pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders to a holy vigilance over the hearts and lives of the congregation. They are to watch over, be on guard for, be concerned for the spiritual good of the whole flock. And pause and take this in for a minute because Paul is using language that is a little bit unusual for him. Jesus uses shepherd language frequently and flock language. Peter uses shepherd and flock language. The Old Testament uses shepherd and flock language about pastors and people. Much of the rest of the New Testament uses shepherd flock language, but Paul is fairly restrained in that. You'll only find Paul doing it infrequently. So this is quite interesting. He takes this language from shepherding, and he calls on the pastor teachers to shepherd the flock. And this charge is this imperative is to spur the elders to a deliberate attention to the spiritual condition of the congregation. They're asking questions like, are they trusting Christ? Do they understand the gospel? Can they explain it? Are they good witnesses to Christ, both in their living and in their testimony? Are they falling into gross moral problems? Are they embracing false teaching? Are they growing in grace? Do they understand the means of grace and how they work? And do they attend to them? Are they faithful in their church attendance? Are they committed to the work and worship of the church? Are they fulfilling their membership vows? In other words, they have an anxious concern and burden to look after and to seek to better the spiritual needs of the body. And what does that reflect about the church itself? that church members should care about these things, and they should care about one another in these things. How often has the testimony of a church member attendant 
to these kinds of things been a real spiritual encouragement to another church member? Because the church member is doing it not in a professional capacity, but as a simple follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I I went through a period of real spiritual struggling for several months while I was in Edinburgh, Scotland, studying at the university. I read all the works of a particular author over a period of about three months, and it was a soul-killing experience. And I was greatly helped by one of my professors, and I was greatly helped by the pastor in my local church, but it was two church members at a meal over an Indian, at an Indian restaurant, who had no idea the struggles that were going on in my heart and life in the course of an ordinary conversation in which they bore such reality to the testimony of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives that I thought this could not happen if if they were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. These people would not be like they are. And that is one of the things that the Lord used to pull me back from the precipice. Just church members cared about their own souls and blessing my soul because of their care for their own souls. Third, look at what Paul goes on to say, that we're to be on guard for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Elders, Paul is explaining, pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders are invented by God. And they're called and they're appointed by him for the well-being of his own dear church. They are made by the Holy Spirit. Paul is reminding us of the heavenly origin of those who are called to pastoral work in the local congregation. Now, Paul knows that these elders have been chosen by the people. He's even written the job description so that the people of God can vote well. You'll find it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The people of God are to look for those things as they elect their pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. That's the way it was from the very beginning in the early church. The people of God elected their pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. But Paul also wants them to be keenly conscious that the vote of the people is only the proximate origin of the call of a pastor. Ultimately, It comes from God himself, the Holy Spirit, who has created the offices and work of the church and called them to it. When Danny gets to Ephesians 4 and opens up the gifts that Jesus gives to his church, just take this in. Every time you see pastor shepherds ordained in your local congregation, you are seeing visible, tangible proof that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, ruling the world by his word and spirit and in gifting the church with just what she needs for thriving and maturing and witnessing and growing. And the Apostle Paul is just reminding us of that here. It's God, the Holy Spirit, that calls and gifts these pastor, teacher, shepherds to the church. Paul may well have trained most of these men, or all of these men that he's talking to, but it was the Holy Spirit who called them. It was the Holy Spirit who gave them to the church. He was the originating force behind their being given to the church. This is important for all of you who are pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders. It is God who has called you. Yes, the congregation has called you. Yes, the congregation has elected you, but it is to God that you must give your account. Here's what Calvin says. The care of the church has been committed to your charge by God. Accordingly, greater conscientiousness is demanded from them because there is going to be a difficult reckoning before the supreme judgment seat. Do you remember the John Brown quote that Mark read this afternoon? Although the Lord intended ministers of the word to be chosen from the beginning by the votes of men, 
Nevertheless, he always arrogates the direction of the church to himself, not only so that we may acknowledge him as its one and only governor, but also that we may know that the incomparable treasure of salvation comes only from him. For he is cheated of his glory if we think that the gospel is given to us either by chance or by the will and activity of men. And so what is it important for church members to learn from that? That when they are gathered together, however small a band, and they have been given a pastor, teacher, shepherd by God, a supernatural gift is in operation in their midst. And they should make it a joy for their pastor to shepherd them. And they should give praise to God that God has given them that shepherd. And realize that God doesn't give you things that you don't need. There are so many people who think that the church is optional. It's, it may be helpful, but it's not necessary in my Christian life. God doesn't give you gifts that you don't need. If God gives you the gift, you need it. And so the people of God understand that this life together in which I'm bound up with these pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders who are pouring out the Word of God into my life, I don't just need this. I can't live without it. God made the Christian life to be congregational. I can't fulfill most of the sanctificational exhortations of the New Testament without the congregation. I've got to have that kind of mutual accountability in the congregation to live the Christian life because the Christian life is congregational. Fourth, notice what Paul says. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. Elders are called to the work of pastoring, and they do this as pastor, shepherd, guardian, protector, feeders. Notice this language. He has appointed the elders. Look up at verse 17. He sent for the elders, the presbyteroi, plural. And he tells the elders that God has made them overseers. Now, in some translations of the Bible, that verb or that term, episkopos or episkopoi, is translated bishops. So notice this is not referring to two distinct offices of presbyter or priest and bishop, as our hierarchical friends would say. This is the same work, presbyter and bishop. Notice presbyter is used more frequently in the New Testament, and it is the title. Bishop is the function. Presbyter's bishop. Elders shepherd. That's what elders do. So they're not called as foremen or taskmasters. They're called as guardians, watchmen, shepherds, protectors to guide and direct and protect and feed and help the flock of God. That's what God calls them to do. Notice again, this is not overbearing carnal authority on full steroid display. This is gentle, fatherly, careful, biblical authority that is meant for the blessing of the congregation. And so what does the congregation learn from this? When they see this kind of fatherly authority exercised for their own well-being, first of all, heads of homes learn how to exercise that kind of authority in their own families. Not abusive authority, but paternal pastoral authority in all of their various relations. In other words, this flows throughout the life of the whole congregation and affects it in its attitude and in its actions. The elders are called to the work of pastoring. And that very pattern of pastoring that they do as guardian, watchmen, protectors sets the tone for the whole life of the congregation. 
finally, look at the very end of this passage. It is the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Paul is saying that pastor, teacher, shepherd, elders have been entrusted with God's own inheritance. Just take that in for a second. You know, when you ask God, what is it that you wanted out of all of this? You know, you sent, you sent your son into this world to live in an estate of humiliation and suffering and ultimately to die. And I know what I get out of this, Lord. You've made me a co inheritor with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've spared me from hell. You've adopted me as your own child. You've justified me. You are sanctifying me. One day you'll glorify me. I understand what I'm getting, but what are you getting out of this? And God's answer is, I'm getting you. You're what I want out of this. You, my people, that's, you're my inheritance. You get me and all my blessings, and what I get is you, my church, my people. That's what I get. And the Apostle Paul is reminding us that that inheritance of God was purchased at an incalculably precious cost. Paul is reminding the elders of the exceeding preciousness of the people whom he is called to pastor. God himself has redeemed, purchased, and paid for his people, his church, his vineyard, his son's body, his children, all those names that the uh, New Testament calls the people of God gathered in his body. And this has been done through the infinite cost of the death and dereliction of his own son. It is a grave thing to be entrusted with such a gift. You know, can you imagine a friend that you've met maybe here at Southeastern Seminary? And you, you met in your first semester and you became fast friends. And before you graduated, you were making your first will. And you went to that dear friend and, and you said, you know, if, if something should ever happen to my wife and I, I wonder if you would be willing to be guardian over our children. You're, you're, my, you're my best friend. I, I have an unbelieving set of brothers and sisters. Your values are the same values. Would you be willing to be guard? Heaven, heaven forbid that something ever happened, but would you be willing to be a guardian? And your friend says yes. And two years later, you're ministering at your church, and your wife and yourself, you're driving home from church one night, and there's a horrible accident. And you're gone. And your friend now has your children. And incredibly, incredibly precious trust has been put into the hands of your friend and his wife. Well, you, pastor, teacher, shepherds, elders, have been given the flock purchased by the blood of God's own Son. There is nothing more precious to Him in this universe. This is the apple of His eye. And He says, take care of them for me, would you? John Stott, in his commentary on this passage, quotes from Richard Baxter's The Reformed Pastor which is in many ways just a meditation on Acts 20, 28. And here's what Richard Baxter says. Oh, then let us hear these arguments of Christ whenever we feel ourselves grow dull and careless as shepherds. Did I die for them? And you will not even look out for them? Were they worth my blood, and they're not even worth your labor? Did I come down from heaven to earth to seek and save that which was lost, and you will not go next door or over one street or to the next village to seek them? 
How small is your labor and condescension in comparison to mine? I debased myself to this. But it is your honor to be so employed in caring for them. Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation, and was I willing to make you a co-worker with me, and you will refuse the little that lies upon your hands? Now, Paul wants us to understand the exceeding preciousness to God of what he has given into your arms and ask you to labor for accordingly. It is a precious thing to be entrusted with the membership of a local congregation. It is a precious thing. And what do church members learn about that? They are part of a precious body. It's not a voluntary organization. Jesus didn't die for a voluntary organization. He died for his body, his flock, his people. We belong to him. We are bought with a price. And it is a glorious thing to be a member in that local body. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask that we would serve more faithfully and joyfully as your shepherds, and we would appreciate more fully the blessing that it is to be members of a local church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.